Today we have Thermo Fisher Scientific with a presentation by Paul Goody and Chen Jin Tu. Paul Goody graduated from the University at Buffalo with PhD in microbiology and immunology. He joined Thermo Fisher Scientific in 2009. He has 12 years of experience in cell culture medium development for both custom and catalog formulations. He now leads a multiomics R&D team. His team is investigating the use of proteomics and metabolomics to advance upstream bioprocesses for the production of therapeutic proteins and vaccines. Chen Jin Tu received his PhD from Shanghai Institute of Biochemistry and Cell Biology in Biochemistry and Cell Biology. He has been in the field of mass spectrometry-based omics for more than 15 years. He joined Thermo Fisher Scientific in 2018. Since then, he's established and applied the multiomics platform to advance cell culture, medium development for CHO, HEC, and T cells, etc. Please welcome our presenters as they share their knowledge with us. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody joining. Uh, I'm glad that you were able to um, take some time to learn about what we're doing in our multiomics group, and I hope that you find this uh, presentation interesting. We're going to cover uh, basically starting with an evolution of medium design um, for cell culture uh, bioprocessing. Uh, basically kind of going over the traditional approaches that are utilized um, for developing both media and feed. And then we will get into our multi-omics group. And when we do that, we'll transition to Shenzhen um, who will present that uh, information. So why don't we start first with the evolution of uh, medium development in response to clonal diversity. As many of you know, CHO is the workhorse in biotherapeutics. Uh, it's utilized both in the production of protein, but as well as um, some uh, vaccine work as uh, workflows. And it has been around for going on almost 60 years, I would say, um, in the industry. It's derived from the Chinese hamster. Um, you know, the, the work that was done in 1957 by uh, the Puck Group um, established the first Cho cell line. And from there, we get our three major um, Cho uh, families, uh, Cho K1, DG44, as well as the Cho S um, uh, production cell lines that are put forward by Thermo Fisher Scientific. And the reason why this cell line is used so much is because it is very highly characterized, which is helpful when you're trying to create a um, biotherapeutic um, bioproduction system. Uh, it's very easy uh, to be able to modify its genome, uh, almost a little bit too easy because uh, it modifies it itself. As you know, Cho is always going through epigenetic changes and reorganization of its chromatin. So that can be a challenge when dealing with clonal diversity, um, but it's relatively adaptable. It's in suspension. Um, it's a high producing um, protein cell line that also secretes its protein which allows for ease of um, purification afterwards. So it's, it's where we have um, focused much of our work over the last five years as we've developed our um, multi-omics uh, techniques. And we'll, uh, we'll be looking into uh, continuing that work in other cell lines as well. So if you think about clonal diversity, um, really what, there's a couple of ways that you can think about it. First is that if you took say 100 clones producing different molecules or the same molecule, and you ran them in the same media formulation, each one of those clones is gonna have a different response to that medium formulation because it's going to have a, a different metabolic need and, and a metabolic baseline that it's going to um, require. And some will be very high performers in terms of producing titer, and some will be extremely low performers in producing titer. But any formulation can only cover a certain amount of clones because of that. And when you think of that medium design space, if you can think about it in terms of a three-dimensional um, design space, which is going to cover both growth, product quality, and titer, and in that design space is every possible medium that we could, um, we could come up with, infinite amount of medium formulations, different concentrations and components, the clones will take up a spot that is the best medium environment for that clone in that large medium space. And this is all well and good, but any particular medium is only going to cover 
a portion of that design space. And so some clones will work really well in one formulation, but not work well in another due to the differences in those formulations. And it's the goal is to customize and optimize medium formulations in order to maximize the protein that your clone is producing. And so that's the, that's the role of the, the medium development scientist is to try to get as much out of any particular clone as we can um, through medium design. So how was this done in the past? Well, quite honestly, it was done in a process that simply increased the concentration of certain components, typically amino acids, some vitamins and glucose. And in that process, just watch a, a response curve. And as the dose of the nutrient went up, there was a response curve that went into its place. And at first this was um, very effective uh, because you know, at the time, most, of, uh, most formulations were uh, really simple. Um, and a lot of it was covered by the addition of, say, um, uh, FBS or something along those lines. This evolved over time as we've been pressured to remove things like hydrolysates, FBS, those types of things. Then we wanted to be able to have a what's called a chemically defined formulation um, that was lacking in proteins. We needed to come up with uh, more sophisticated sophisticated approaches, such as a design of experiment approach that would look at classes of components in a, in a multifactorial design. And when that was done, we were able to remove much of the undefined media material. And the process that, that is done in is basically going through a series of experiments that starts off with a media mixture study, DOE, where we look at and measure the consumption rates of mostly just amino acids, and then from that amino acid consumption rates that are analyzed, we go back to the, you know, the metabolic pathways and we try to deduce a, a story as to why those amino acids are being used at those rates and what could possibly be occurring with all of the other components within the formulation and then design a DOE against that. The DOE looks um, predominantly at both growth and titer, trying to find that best formulation that's a balance between the medium and feed resulting in a higher titer and a higher production. And this is a process that's now been done, I would say for the last 20 years, um, over and over again with, with relative success. The issue is that now we are getting to the point where trying to modify formulations, we're hitting concentration re restrictions as well as getting components that are now acting against each other. And so we need to take a deeper look um, this is also all based on spent medium, and that is a, a major concern because we're not looking at what the cell actually truly needs and truly is um, important to those cells. And so with that, we can step forward into the future and look at what's happening with a multi-omics approach instead. And I'm going to switch seats and allow uh, Shenzhen to take over from here. Hi, everybody. This is Chen Jian. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Paul has like uh, uh, talked about uh, the evolution of uh, and the history of cell culture media development. So next, uh, I will introduce concept, benefits, workflows, and uh, a case study of metaomics in media design. Um, through the presentation, uh, you will know what is metaomics why we need to incorporate metaomics in our median design and how to apply metaomics in median design. And of course, uh, we, we will show more details in our case study. So first, what, what's metaomics? Uh, from genotype to phenotype, there are uh, many layers omics, such as genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and uh, uh, metabolomics. Metaomics aims to combine two or more omics data sets to investigate biological pathways in a more comprehensive way. For example, to investigate what's under the puzzles, we can use non-targeted omics, such as 
transcriptomics. Transcriptomics, proteomics, or metabolomics, and the lipidomics to reveal more and more of its contents. Then we can transfer the targeted metabolomics analysis to, to targeted, so which can be designed to only monitor, like here is the secret smile of Mona Lisa to improve sensitivity and the save time. Currently, we are in the discovery stage and using non-targeted omics approach. After that, we will identify more key pathways and networks in our chill cells. We will, then we will move to verification stage and using targeted omics analysis. Talking about the benefits, so we want to do like a, a compare to the traditional media development workflow. So in the traditional way, we can say like uh, uh, it started with uh, uh, tech transfer, then like a uh, way we have median mixed DOE, median optimization DOE, then feed DOE and the process optimization. So lots of like uh, uh, DOE iterations. And uh, for our metaomics, we start with a panel screening. Then we do metaomics data analysis including data integration and interpretation. Then we will have a, a, a function directed like a DOE design. Then after that, we will also optimize our process and lead to a final formulation. The difference between these two methods is like a, the traditional way only monitor less than 50 molecules. And uh, it's only like to rebalance existing components. Our metaomics methods can monitor around 8,000 molecules. And the way we definitely will like uh, uh, introduce new components in our medium. So next up, I will talk about the workflows, how to apply metaomics in medium design. So first, we will like establish a metabolic baseline. So adapt it to a panel or median and perform the regular growth performance assay and then collect our cell samples and spam median samples. For the metaomics analysis, we have like automated sample preparation. Then we are using our uh, OB trap based instruments to do metaomics analysis. After that, we will do database search, like a uh, pathway analysis and the metaomics integration and the interpretation. So we can like uh, identify some key pathways and the networks, influencing our like uh, GPA features such as cell growth and the titer, and then design and validate the DOE factors in our Ember experiments. We definitely also will monitor the QC or monoclonal antibody aligned with our customers' requirements. So here is more details about establishing a metabolic baseline. First, we need to select like a, a small scale cell culture model, right? Which is robust and, and scalable. Here we usually like right now, usually like uh, use like a fat badge cultivation, but we are not limited to that. We also can uh, do investigate like a perfusion, right? And uh, for, for the fat badge cultivation, we will design the uh, testing medium with higher diversity. So we can compare conditions like uh, such as low VCD to high VCD, low titer to high titer, low viability to high viability to like find the difference between these conditions and learn from each other. Spent media analysis and, and, and the QC or monoclonal antibody will be also incorporated in our pipeline. That's a routine way to to, to do like uh, our like uh, analysis. So for metaomics analysis, we will collect the cells and the spent medium, and then would like to perform like a, a cellular proteomics, cellular metabolomics, and the spent medium metabolomics. After sample preparation, we will perform proteomics runs on our OB-trap fusion lumens 
and our metabolomics runs on our OBTRAP IDX. And then followed by data analysis and the metabolomics integration, which will lead to the final OMS guided DOE design. Here we want to, one thing is we want to emphasize our OMS platform emphasize on the reproducibility and the sensitivity. So make our decision is very accurate. So we can really like uh, target our, our like a uh, title and the cell growth. So for metabolite identification, we use our OB12 IDX tribrid mass back. So this one has three mass analyzers, quadruple linear entrap, OB12. And it provides very high accurate MS1 and MS2. So make sure like uh, we can like uh, identify more endogenous metabolites. For the database search and the quantification, we use our like semi-officious compound discoverer software, which has a comprehensive integrated library and a database. The node-based like a workflow makes the database search and the statistical analysis faster and easier. As you can see, so different groups will cluster together and give an average of tick area so you can compare different groups and get relative ratios like that. For our proteomics platform, we have optimized it from tip to toe. For example, we, we have compared the different travel columns, analytical columns, and the ESI emitters. We also like uh, have optimized the many HPLC uh, parameters like a flow rate, gradient, and also mass spec like uh, parameters, and MS2 like uh, uh, time isolation, those kind of parameter, key parameters. So after the optimization, it, it allow us to identify more than 6,000 proteins from a single run on a shorter like column, only 25 centimeter column. Our main like optimization actually is on the travel column. Larger ID travel column allow us to run like more than 100 samples. So here, uh, I will talk about the uh, protein quantification. What we use is like a MS1 based uh, quantification. Like other quantification methods based on special counts or MS2 TIC, Actually, like uh, uh, for low abundance proteins, our icon based method has better reproducibility. Like uh, you can see here, for low abundance protein, other methods, the variation is very large. Ours is pretty good. And also because we like use the like a uh, larger ID trap and uh, clean our samples, so it allow us to identify more than 100 samples. So here we designed an experiment to run 100 times of HeLa protein digest standards. So you can see like uh, this like uh, uh, retention time is pretty good, less than 1% code CV and uh, for the intensity, after 100 run, it only drop less than 20%. If we don't optimize our system, usually it, the, the intensity will drop like more than 50% after 100 runs. So right now our system can quantify more than 7,000 proteins across one, more than 100 samples with high reproducibility. So here, like uh, we use like uh, lots of like uh, bioinformatics tools to perform analysis, like a uh, principal components analysis. You can see like uh, uh, different days cluster into together, right? And also you can see even in, different, in the same day, different conditions can be well separated, which means we can find the difference from those conditions. That's good. We can learn from like each conditions, right? And also we will do some cluster heat map to further uh, filter out those like uh, altered proteins or metabolites. Then do like a no, novel like networks, try to find out the novel pathways and uh, then we will like uh, based on those like uh, altered pathways and uh, networks to design our final DOE. 
So as you can see, like we use like a bioinformatic tools in every step in our metaomics like analysis. And even we use that before like our like a like a metabolic baseline establishment. We can use like a principal component analysis to select the basal median to test. We wanted to have those basal median have a higher diversity. So those like a medium might will give us great like a possibility to improve our cell growth and uh, tighter. And we definitely also will use our like a modeling system, in silico modeling system, and uh, those machine learning to learn from our data. So find out what's like a, a hit behind our omics data and uh, give us unbiased decisions. So here I will talk about, talk about one case study. So in this, this one, the cell line is QS cell line uh, and the two median was tested. So you can see like uh, uh, this cell line like uh, uh, can produce 40% more IgG in median one than median two. And uh, the customer require us to improve median two to exceed the median one performance by 50%. So which means we need to we need to improve the title about 100 percent right, based on median two. So in this study, we like uh, in order to find the uh, what's happening in the early stage. So we collect the, uh, our cell sample and the spent median sample on day zero, day three, and day five. Each, each condition we have like a four replicates in order to like uh, get like a uh, more statistical meanings. So after like uh, we like uh, collect this sample, we do like a uh, proteomics analysis and the metabolomics analysis. And then we also will do those pathway analysis. The most important way we will like uh, integrate them together to see which pathway is really like uh, the key pathway, uh, which will like influence tighter and the cell growth. Then we will use those information to design our DOE. So based on like uh, MS uh, medium two, we add uh, some components in, in, in medium two to test that. So as you can see, like after our optimization, we like uh, uh, improve our title uh, about 50% than median one, which met our customer's requirements. So right now our metaomics approach is mainly like uh, utilized in median development uh, uh, and uh, for other, we, we are not limited to this. So we, uh, right now we are applying like a omics approach for like a quality control and the quality assurance in medium manufacturing. And, uh, and definitely and for others. So no matter the stage you are, like uh, in your process, we offer a service to, to like a uh, match. We, we want you to consider us as a partner and the extension of your own process development team. And it just happens we have like a enormous capacity to improve and produce your media. So for this summary slide, I would like to emphasize several take home messages. First message is the difference between traditional workflow and our metaomics approach. Simply speaking, metaomics allow us to monitor more molecules and identify limitations beyond the component depletion. So which means we can introduce new components. Second, we have successfully applied our metaomics methods in two like external cases where metaomics provided a solution while the traditional approach could not. Third, 
we cannot emphasize enough the importance of application of data science in metaomics lead media design. Metaomics analysis will generate a large scale of data, which could be used to train the machine learning algorithm and then enable us to predict cell growth and tighter. Uh, for the final solution, we will improve our cell growth and improve our tighter. 